how do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects. Candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. So here at the Culture Architects show, we love uncovering what other fields and disciplines can teach us about company culture and culture building. Our guest today is Saul Blinkoff, and Saul's got a whole different background I think you're going to find really interesting. He was a Disney animator. He later was a Hollywood director and producer and even a life coach. Saul's dream of becoming a movie director first came up way back in 1984 after seeing Steven Spielberg's E.T. Remember that movie? It was a great movie. He ended up studying at the Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio, and they went on to Walt Disney Studios on an animation internship. For over 20 years, Saul has worked with some of the biggest names in the media and entertainment industry, including Disney, DreamWorks, Mattel, Netflix, and Amazon. I can tell we're going to be again into a, for, for a really interesting conversation today. So, Saul, welcome to the Culture Architects podcast. Thank you so much, David. Such a pleasure to be here and uh, really happy to meet uh, virtually all of your listeners. Thanks for showing yeah. up, everybody. All right. <laughs> so before we do anything else, let's just get a little bit of history here. And so we're going back 1984. I'm recording this in 2024. So it was 40 years ago. Hard to believe. It is hard. And to let's believe. get some, a little bit of a context for our listeners. So you saw, go back to 1984, you saw ET, something about that struck a chord in you and you said, man, I'm into this. Tell me what that was about. Yeah. I mean, look, I grew up in New York, <laughs> okay. so um, I, I didn't know any, before before ET, I just loved to draw. I, I was an artist. Mm -hmm. I used to draw on everything. I used to draw on the walls with my mother's lipstick. Uh -huh. You know, I tell my kids, do not try that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I was going to be an artist. I'm 11 years old. I go to the movies. I'm sitting in the theater and the movie was so impactful to me because it was a movie where the kid was not the idiot. It was the adults <laughs> that were oblivious. His mother mm -hmm. doesn't know what's going on. And it felt really empowered. I felt empowered as a kid. I was a middle child. I have an older brother. I have a twin sister who's six mm -hmm. minutes younger than me. So I'm watching a movie that I felt like it, my parents were divorced and this kid's divorced. So I really felt like I could connect to this kid and he was so empowered. And I remember the credits were rolling. I tap my mom at the end of the movie and I go, mom, that's what I want to do someday. And she says to me, what, you, you, you want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. Mom, I want to be a filmmaker. And like I said, I grew up in New York. I didn't know any filmmakers. I didn't even know that was a job you could have. You know, people I knew were lawyers. My dad was a doctor, had business, businesses. I didn't know anyone had a creative job or a field. Mm -hmm. And it just called to me. So I was inspired. I went to the library and I got books on cameras, lenses, storyboarding. I found out that this is what Steven Spielberg did every week. And he made movies when he was my age. Mm -hmm. So I got kids in the neighborhood, my twin sister, my older brother. We started making movies, you know, murder movies, monster movies. We made a kidnap movie. I tied my sister up to a tree really tight for the end <laughs> scene. I'll never forget. Afterwards, we go into the house to watch the movie. I still remember my mom going, I, I like the movie, but where's your sister? <laughs> I said, she's still tied to the tree. What's wrong? <laughs> so yeah. I knew I was going to be a filmmaker, um, but it actually it changed very quickly because a couple years later, I was in high school and I'm walking down the halls one day. Somebody comes up to me and they said, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I said, I want to be a filmmaker. I want to be a director. They're like, no, you don't want to do that. I said, no, no, I do. It's my dream. They go, no, you don't. Because if you want to be a director, you're going to have to move out to Hollywood. And Hollywood is filled with strange weirdos. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me and said, you don't want to end up a weirdo, do you? I said, no, I don't. And right then and there, I literally gave up on my dream because one person told me I would end up a weirdo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, today I do live in Hollywood and my four kids would tell you their dad is a weirdo. So, so mm -hmm. much for that. Yes. But when I reflect on that story, David, it reminds me how so often in life we believe in ourselves that we can accomplish something. We have a goal. Somebody says something, it can empower us, make us believe that we can do it. But then there's that other voice that tells you that that's not for you. And unfortunately, sometimes we listen to that latter voice. And at that point, that's what I listened to. And I gave up. I gave up on that dream. I will no longer want to be a director. So my parents like, so what are you going to do? I go, well, I'll go back to drawing. And I was very lucky because I had very supportive parents. They got a private teacher to come to our home wow. and teach me to draw from life. She was amazing. She would set up a bowl of fruit 
And she'd say like one day it's going to be pencil, the next day oil painting. And she was amazing. Uh, actually, I remember one time she says to me, I want you to go draw people in restaurants. That was very awkward wow. for me. I want to be sitting in a restaurant drawing people. Yeah. She goes, you have to learn how to draw from life. And she said these words to me, drawing is it not, it's not about copying. It's about seeing, mm. developing your eye to look at the world a certain way. She's yeah. amazing. So I get all my drawings together yeah. and I show them to her. And she's like, I like the drawings, but I just noticed that all the people that you drew, none of them have hands. Why is that? Did they not have hands at the restaurant? I'm like, no, they had hands. She goes, so why didn't you draw them? I said, well, because drawing hands is very difficult for me. She said, boom, guess what your homework's going to be? Every single night before you go to bed, you're going to draw a hand from a different position. Hmm. And in six months, I got really good at drawing hands. Yeah, your and she taught me pretty active in all this. Oh, Yeah. And she taught me one of the most valuable lessons. If we want to be great at anything, we need to find our weakness and turn it into our strength. Boom. So that was it. I was going to be an artist until junior year of high school. And I see one more movie that changes my life. I'll hum the song, David. See if you know what movie it is. Okay. Here we go. Dun, 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 no, I I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you lyrics here. Right, the seaweed is always greener in somebody else's lake. You dream about going up there. No, half your audience is screaming right. at their cars right now saying, sure. David, don't you know? Under the sea, the little mermaid. There mm -hmm. you go. You're the one that hasn't seen it. I heard there was one. <laughs> so I watched, yeah. I watched the little mermaid and I'm, I'm blown away. The animation is exhilarating. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the movie, the credits are rolling. And I tap my mom and I go, mom, no, no, that's what I want to do. And she's like, what, you want to fall in love with a fish? I'm like, no, no, no. I want to go into animation because animation combined my, my two passions, right. my love of drawing, my love of filmmaking, put them together, Disney animation. And plus I found out that Disney had a studio in Orlando, Florida. Right. I don't have to go out to LA. So there I was junior in high school and I knew what my dream was. My dream was to become a Disney animator. That's really how it started. Interesting. So I want to go back to your comment about the life lesson that you should look at your weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Yeah. Because there'd be many people that would say that's actually the opposite. Um, certainly, uh, why can't I think of his name right now? Uh, who's done all the strengths finders, Marcus Buckingham, uh -huh. uh, who's put out a lot of research that would suggest actually quite the opposite, that one of the when, when he did research on lots and lots of coaches and managers to find out what do the best managers in the world do? He's a research junkie and did a tremendous amount of research. And he found the biggest common denominator among the best coaches was that instead of trying to fix people's weaknesses, they play to their strengths and they find out what are your strengths? What are the things that you're naturally gifted to? And when you're working towards your strengths, you tend to be like, you know, rowing with the current instead of against the current and spending more time on that. Look, so I agree with you think about that. Okay. So here's what I, I like the idea of, yes, you got to figure out what your strengths are. And that's, what's ultimately going to be the energy to move you forward, but to be more complete and to achieve a higher level of greatness. Look, I grew up in the nineties. Here's what that means. That means that I actually do know for a fact who the greatest basketball player is that ever lived. His name is Michael Jordan. I say okay. it's Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> All right, we can debate go. that another time. We, <laughs> and, and we will, my friend. <laughs> so this is a true story about Michael Jordan. His first year in the NBA, first year, he's already Air Jordan. He has sneakers made from him before he even stepped on the court. And after one of his games, first year, first season, a sports writer comes up to him and says, Michael, you're a scoring machine, but your defense, not so good. You got to work on that defense. You know, Michael could have said to the guy, dude, I just made a gajillion dollars playing basketball. I got sneakers. Your kid probably has my Michael Jordan posters up all over his bedroom. I'm going to listen to you. C could you get out of my face? That's not what he said. You see, years later in an interview, Michael said he heard one thing. Something I'm doing is giving that guy the perception that I don't have a defensive game. I guess I better work harder on defense. And he did. And two years later, one player in the NBA was not just a little good at defense, was not just a little great at defense. He became the defensive player of the year, number 23, Michael Jordan, for one reason. Because he knew when he stepped out on that court, I got to be a complete player. I'll give you a story that happened to me. This is 
my first day, I was directing a show at DreamWorks Animation. And it's a Madagascar show, TV show called Madagascar A Little Wild. It was on Hulu, Peacock. And I'm looking at different storyboard artists that I'm hiring to storyboard out sequences of the show. And this one girl is just incredible. She's got to be like 24 years old. Her drawings are amazing. But I can't get her on my show. I'm just borrowing her from another show that DreamWorks was making at the time called Spirit, the horse, the horse show. Mm-hmm. And I sent her one day over lunch. I'm like, let me ask you a question. Why did you choose Spirit? I mean, you could have been on any show. Her answer blew me away. She says, I choose to be on Spirit because I was terrible at drawing horses. Mm-hmm. Wow. She could have been on something else where she drew people really well and, and she thrived. Probably, she might have been more successful. <laughs> but at 24, she's like, if that's a weakness, I'm going to go there. I think sure. eventually the thing that people really want and why they stray away from embracing weakness is because people want to look in the mirror and feel good about who they are and what they can do. Sure. And you get that rush, that drug when you do something well, as opposed to when you fail, especially when it's public. And that's why the workplace culture, it's really important in leadership to not just when a a, a coworker, a worker fails at something and their weakness is public and, and just be like, oh, you know what? That's okay. You have to empower them and encourage them to fail because the only way they're going to fail is if they try something they haven't done. If they're going to try something, if they're going to innovate, you have to create a culture where people are going to go, you know what? The only way we're going to learn is if we fail. So let's talk about that. So tell me about some of your experiences. So you're doing animation and and then you eventually be, did become director producer and you had a chance to lead some teams of people. Oh, yeah. And certainly one of the things that I've seen is that leading teams of people when they're creative types can be very different than leading other types of people. So what did you learn about the the culture of creative types and how is that different in building culture there? Yeah. Great question. First of all, you're asking questions I've never been asked and I love that. <laughs> They're great questions. Uh, and it makes me have to dig deeper. So it's great. Um, okay. Here's the thing. When you're leading creative types, mm-hmm. artists, <laughs> because I am an artist and I grew up in that world, I know that artists have, um, you need courage to create. You know, if you think about a child creating, they take out a blank piece of paper and they take mm-hmm. a red crayon and they're about to make a mark that no one has ever made before. It's funny. Sometimes I, you know, I, I speak, I travel the world as an inspirational speaker, corporate keynotes and such. And I'll have a room full of a thousand people in front of me that are not artists. And my goal for the next 50 minutes is to get them out of their comfort zone and show them that they can draw. They can do something they didn't know they could do. Mm -hmm. So what do I do in the beginning? I got this room full of people and I say to them, raise your hand if you're an artist. Maybe one hand goes up fast and then there'll be another hand that kind of went up, but then it went down quickly because it saw the other hand went up faster. And then I make the point to them. I said, you know what? If you were six years old, and I asked, how many of you love to draw? How many of you are artists? Do you know that every single one of your hands would have went up? Every kid loves to create because they're creating just for the thrill of creativity. To create something that's never been there. It's an extension of what makes me unique. But then when you become a teenager and all that social stuff starts to fit in, it's not just what am I drawing or creating? It's how does it compare to the person next to me? Sure. And if I think that that person next to me is more successful I will instantly say, oh, they're the artist, I'm not. Yep. But wait a minute, what about the pleasure you felt in creating, in making a mark? You see, the goal of creativity isn't just to get to an outcome that wows your peers. It's the goal of creativity is literally the pleasure of creating. Mm-hmm. That's the goal of it. That's what it should be. That's the pleasure of it. That's when the happy accidents, as Bob Ross used to say, the painter, happen when you're creating. So to me, um, it's very, very important that, you know, for the culture to understand that as adults who embrace creativity and even the ones that don't, they both need courage. And it's our job in leadership, like I said earlier, to empower their uniqueness. You know, one of the things I tell my team all the time is there are no two people on this team 
that are the same, which means no two people in the world will ever have the same purpose, which really means no two people are ever in competition with each other because we have to do something different. And I'm just telling you story mm -hmm. after story as a producer, seeing artists accomplish things they didn't know they could accomplish. Mm -hmm. Seeing that, that's the greatest thrill for me. Seeing the growth. It's either a growth mindset or it's not. It's either I'm the person that does this well, bring me in to do it, or I'm the person that learns well. Mm -hmm. And if you see me as an artist or as a director, as a producer a year later, and I'm doing the same level of work, there's no growth. Yeah, I'm going to be safe. But at the end of the day, the pleasure won't be there for me because right. I'm not growing. So you've seen, you know, having worked in the industry, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are plenty of examples of animation studios, creative organizations that have flourished and produced great stuff year after year and others that have struggled and failed. Yeah. And I'm curious, so what's the difference? What makes some difference? of them better than others? <laughs> Another great question. I love it. Look, I was at, um, I was at Disney at the time when we were really transforming from 2D animation to CG animation. Mm -hmm. So the first film I worked on at Disney was Pocahontas. This is right after Lion King. Now we, we had what we call the golden age. It started with Little Mermaid. Before Little Mermaid, the Walt Disney Studios was animation studios was literally going to close down. Walt had died in the 70s. They made movies like Fox and the Hound. Then they made The Black Cauldron. It was very dark. Oliver and Company. All these other movies. And Disney animation was losing its way. Michael Eisner comes in, brings Jeffrey Katzenberg in, and they bring in Alan Menken and Howard Ashman from Broadway. We're going to do Broadway music in a Disney animated film? Like, people laughed at it. They scoffed at this idea. And they come out with The Little Mermaid, a big risk, and the movie is huge. It's huge. And just when you think it can't be any better than that, Beauty and the Beast comes out next. Boom. It's so big, it's nominated for an Oscar not for an animated feature category. That didn't exist back then. It was nominated for the category called Best Picture. That was unheard of. This kid's movie, Best Picture, it lost to Silence of the Lambs that year. Very different kind of movie. Mm -hmm. Well, after Beauty and the Beast comes out, no one thought, thinks it could ever be bigger than that, Aladdin comes out. And who's going to see Aladdin? Seven and eight-year-olds? No, teenagers, 20-year-olds. It's a date night movie. It's cool to see animation. Incredible. Now, the year Aladdin came out, another animated movie came out starring Robin Williams. We all know he did the voice of the genie. So people were saying, oh, Aladdin's so great because he got Robin Williams. He's the genie. But there's another movie that came out the same year. Animated film came out from a studio, I think, called Rich Ross. Or maybe it was Fox. The movie was called Rockadoodle. I bet you never heard of it. Never heard of it. There you go. Because not one actor makes a movie. What's the special sauce? What's that special thing that makes a successful movie? It has to be all centered around, this goes for story, any stories. You have to relate and love your main character. Mm -hmm. You have to see yourself in them. You have to want them to succeed. As a matter of fact, there was an early screening of the film Aladdin, and they were watching an animatic, which is basically storyboards shot in sequence before you animate, mm -hmm. and you throw it up on reels and show it to the executive to see how it's playing before you spend the money on the animation. So they're showing a sequence to Jeffrey Katzenberg and it's the scene in the opening of the movie where Aladdin sings the song One Jump Ahead. He's he's trying to like run past all these guards because he's stealing bread because he's a street mm -hmm. rat, he's Remember homeless. That. Remember that? Yep. And he steals the bread, he sits there and he starts to eat the bread and then Jeffrey Katzenberg, it's a true story, stops everything and goes, whoa, whoa, hold on. D this is my main character? How am I gonna like him if he's a thief? They're like, yeah, but he's hungry, but, yeah, but he's still stealing. How are we going to like him? And he comes up with an idea, which is exactly what you see in the film today. Aladdin does a whole song, One Jump Ahead, risks his life to steal a loaf of bread, sits down in this alley, is about to eat it, and do you remember what happens? He notices <clears throat> next to him there's a <clears throat> trash can, and these two children are starving. And he has a huge loaf of bread. So he shares the bread. How much of the bread does he give them? Just a bite? No. He gives them the whole damn loaf. Now, I love this guy. And we always say in film, there's actually a film book. If anyone's listening that wants to really master storytelling, 
in any facet for that matter. It's called Save the Cat is the name of the film written by Blake Snyder, the late Blake Snyder. He calls the book Save the Cat because he's telling us if you want to love a main character, it's so simple. Make sure they are kind to either an animal, a Mm -hmm. young person, or an old person. And if you want to hate the antagonist, the villain, make them mean to an animal, a young person, or an old person. So that's one of the things that we love about our main characters. Aladdin Mm -hmm. becomes huge. And then, of course, after that, the biggest animated movie ever created, ever made, BF, before Frozen comes out and it's called the lion king Mm -hmm. the roar heard around the world makes huge money and to answer your question simply there have been many films since then that of course you would think everyone knows the formula now it has to come from a sincere place the movies have to come from a sincere place and and the audience knows they know so that's what makes uh, when i hear you saying so is is that's what makes a movie that's going to really work my question is what makes a studio a group of people create those movies and a different group of people not create those movies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love this question. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to throw any studios under the bus that I've worked on because they might still hire me right now, but I'll say it like this. When I'm at Disney or pitching a movie to Pixar, or any of these places, the rules at Disney and Pixar are we want creator driven content. Okay. This is such an important thing creator driven content meaning an executive will say to an artist what story do you want to tell what story do you sincerely care about because ultimately to make an animated film by the way it takes four and a half to five years cost over 200 million dollars and it's not always fun it's very difficult every day of it is difficult people look at the work that goes behind it and they're like wow that's 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 like that's a lot of work. I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of work. You have to, so you want to get your heart into it. So creator driven content, someone comes in with a specific story they want to tell and the executives and producers are going to help navigate that. I've been with other studios mm-hmm. that are very big and I'm in these meetings and they're saying, executives are saying things like, well, what are other studios doing right now? Oh, they're doing a movie about monsters and it's popular or they're doing, like I can tell you specifically cars comes out, Disney Pixar cars comes out huge movie for the studio and specifically because of merchandising cars every kid wants cars everyone's playing with cars so i was in a meeting with dreamworks i guess i can say it i was in a meeting with dreamworks and they are sitting there going what's what's our version of cars now on one hand that makes sense people listening right now yeah they're looking they're right there's merchandising Mm -hmm. possibilities how do we tap into that so they came out with this movie called turbo did you ever see it? No. Did you ever see Cars? I did. There you go. <laughs> so if you can't just you can't just look at the formula. You have to have the creator-driven story of someone wants to tell something. Then if you can marry that with the correct vision on how you're going to market it, that's how you get magic. But it always has to stem from the sincere storyteller, the creator. So what I'm So what I'm curious about is, again, coming back to culture here. So what causes one organization to, it could be in the creative world, it could be in a different world, to have a culture that that, uh, promotes what's going to be successful and what you're sharing is not rocket science. um, uh, And and I'm sure others have figured that out. And so what causes one organization to have a culture that promotes things that will be successful and another organization It, it comes doesn't. down to risk. You know, mm-hmm. to make a Disney Pixar movie, it takes four and a half years. The first year you're writing the script. I can't tell you how many meetings I've had with producers and we're sitting there and they're like, they want to hire me. And they say to me right in the beginning, we want to make a movie that's going to compete with Disney Pixar, but we want to make it in one year. And instead of spending 200 million, our budget is 30 million. And I say the same thing to them. You cannot make a movie that's going to compete with them if you're only putting in that kind of money and that kind of time. Because what you're not doing is you're not culturally giving your artist the time needed to explore ideas. And they start to see it as a factory. But you have to have time. And that really is the most valuable asset, right? There's time and money. You have to have that time to be able to play and see what works. Like what I told you we did at Disney, how we would put the storyboards up on the reels for Jeffrey Katzenberg to see. I've worked for other companies that, no, no, you, you, you just make it. 
You just make it. You, you storyboard it. You put. You animate it. We don't have time to redo the animatic to make it stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And for me as a creator, there's nothing more uninspiring than someone hindering you so much and saying you have to create and go. Because <laughs> great creativity mm -hmm. doesn't really work like that. So I would say to anyone listening, whatever you are, whatever, whatever innovation you want to have and build that culture of creativity, you have to allow your artists and creative people to utilize time to be able to create. Yeah, there are parameters. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was on overtime when yeah. I worked in the movie Mulan and I was working 14 hour days, seven days a week for the last year to get that movie done. But you have to make sure, especially in the beginning, that first year when you're creating the formula, the recipe, before the cooks, the artists even get their hands on it, that recipe has got to be solid. And you ever watched, you know, a great recipe, great, you know, Gordon Ramsay, they have their recipe, but as you're cooking, they'll say like salt and pepper to taste. You got to be able to create while you go. And a lot of those smaller studios mm -hmm. that are out there, there's no time in that in the budget. Remember when you're making an animated film, the producers, the line producers, the name, they have a budget every week, what has to be accomplished. If you throw off one day, the whole thing's, so there's no time allotted to learn along the way. Mm, yeah. And that's the end of the first part of my interview with Saul Blinkoff, Disney animator, Hollywood director and producer, and life coach. In the next episode, Saul and I are gonna cover more of his experiences with culture and culture building across different studios and film projects. Make sure to stay tuned. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders in all walks of life. To book David for your next event or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfriedman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of CultureWise.